We're still in the book of Hebrews. We're approaching this book as Israel was 2,000 years ago. We've been Christians most of our life, and, you know, things are happening in the world. Uh, we find ourselves drifting away. Uh, Israel, these, these were, this book was written to Jewish believers. People who had come into the temple and put their trust in the sacrifices that they'd been making. And they were comfortable being Jews. And then this guy Jesus comes into the scene and and he talks about things that were going to happen. And he ended up getting crucified. And, and, and we believed in him. We believed that he was the Messiah. But now it's been, you know, 20 years. And, you know, we've had to keep things going at home and... We, we just don't know where we are for sure. And so the book of Hebrews traveled all over the world at that time. And it was the last book that basically God gave the church apart from Revelation, which John... And so... This book had become a staple in the diet of the early church. And of course, when they were putting together the books of the New Testament, this was one of the important books. But it's kind of been put on a shelf because we don't really need to know about all the sacrifices and what Israel did, but knowing about it helps us to show God's faithfulness to the world. Not just Israel, but to the whole world. God sent His Son to reveal God's plan for the human race. And so this helps secure the knowledge of God. We, we've been talking about, of course, Israel put their trust in knowing that God was right back here behind the veil. When, when we bring our sacrifices and our offerings to God, the priest comes, takes them, offers them, and, and we have gotten accustomed to using the priest. And, and now you're telling us we need, I mean, our high priest, I mean, we've still got a high priest. But, but of course, right after this book was written, they didn't have one. Israel was no more. So it, it became more important now to identify Jesus with the high priest that we had and, and who the high priest we had was uh, like, Melchizedek. And so we've, we've looked at what it, Hebrews said about Melchizedek, that it was... he. Jesus became a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Whether Melchizedek was actually Jesus before he became incarnate in a man, and we, that, that's way beyond what we can comprehend. It's like, you know, how can you be out here and then not be out there and be here and then not be here but be there and it's kind of like well, these are things you got to take by faith 
because we can't understand it. And so Hebrews, in a way, was doing away with the law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, we no longer are under the law, but we're under grace. And so it's like, where is the footing that we can stand on? So this book was written to help people find their footing. And this 10th chapter is, is almost a summary of who Christ was, what he did, and how it interacts with our faith today. And, and it's also in preparation of chapter 11, which is the faith chapter. And faith is what makes it all work. And so we, we know that Jesus became our high priest. And what, you know, what, what does all this have to do with me today? And so we're trying to find how we are going to be affected by our faith. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, it says that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. And, and so it, it's kind of like, okay, let's go back to Moses. The people didn't have the law. They were kind of on their own good behavior. And guess what? We don't have any good behavior. Man, man's going to do whatever he wants to do. And so God said, well, that's okay for you, maybe in your world, but not for me in my world. And I created you to be in my world. So God is saying, if you are going to be in my world, you know what they call that world? The kingdom of God. <laughs> so if you want to be in my kingdom, you have to play by my rules. And so slowly and eventually, God had a people that he taught and that he rehearsed over and over with them the rules of the kingdom you will you have to obey the law and to be my people and and they were in and out with that sometimes they did sometimes they didn't but it says he, he kind of wraps it all up and and again I, i've spent a lot of time reading the word of god with Hebrews for you. And now he's kind of bringing it to a head. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. Okay, so whatever it is that God has in store for us is going to be good. Good things are coming. So Israel was anticipating something good in whatever God was going to do. But it's not the realities themselves. The law was good in that it was a shadow, but it was not the realities of the good thing. For this reason, it can never, it can never, the law can never. The law couldn't. You understand the not in that? For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice, repeated endlessly year after year. So the priest came in according to the law and offered sacrifices year after year after year. 2,000 years times 12, 12,000 times the priest came in and offered sacrifices. It says it can never make perfect those who draw near to worship. So the for 2,000 years, the priest came in and did the stuff, and but it never brought anybody who came nearer perfect. It did not make perfect 
those who came. The law could never do that. If it could, would they have not, would they not have stopped offering sacrifices? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all. If if the physical sacrifices were making people perfect, what would they have to do over and over and over? Finally, you're, it's, everybody's perfect. We don't need to do it anymore. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. You know, hey, I'm, I don't have any sins. No problem. I'm cleansed. I made ho how I, hallelujah. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. So every year they had to have the priest come and offer the sacrifice because the people were sinful. Even righteous good people had sins they didn't know about. And just to be sure, the priest did his sacrifice to cover all the people's sins that they didn't know about. Because it is impossible, there's that word again, impossible, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And so again, this is kind of wrapping it all up. Don't you see people, Hebrew people, the law and the sacrifices were just an atonement a covering up. There was no removal of your sin. They were just covered up. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice, and again, the book of Hebrews goes back to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Last week I talked about the old covenant. The new covenant was offered by his blood, by Christ's blood. But the old covenant, back during those days, it was pointing toward the new covenant that was to come. And that new covenant, they didn't understand, was going to be in their son. Israel did not understand what it meant that they were the bride of God. God made Israel his bride in order that they would have consummate the Son of God. In Jesus came forth from Israel. He was the son born of Israel. He was a Jew, but he was also of God. And so he satisfied all the requirements needed by the old covenant and the words of the prophets that prepared the world. It's coming. Get ready. It's coming. God is going to send forth the Savior of the world. Look for it. It'll be coming your way soon. The billboards are saying, get ready. It's coming soon. Today, we're saying the same thing. Get ready. It's coming soon. Get ready. The Messiah is going to return. Well, okay, well, we'll kind of gear up for that, you know. How do you gear up for God coming to live with us? You know, this is exciting. God is going to finally come and live freely with us. And so in the, they, the Hebrew writers went back and tried to find all of these words that showed that Jesus was coming. And he went back to the Psalms and it says uh, in verse 5, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire so god did not it wasn't sacrifices and offerings that god needed 
but a body you prepare for me. So God needed a body to prepare for him what he needed to have happen. And he couldn't find one on the earth. There was none. No, no human aspired to be God's person, his sacrifice. Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. God says, do you think, you think I enjoy dying animals? Do you think I need to see death and dying to satisfy something in me? No, I get no pleasure out of the death of goats and bulls. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O oh God. Who? Who could that possibly be talking about? Jesus. It's written in all of the volumes of the book. The book being the Old Covenant. I've written all of these things that you might know about me that is to come. And so Hebrews is a compilation of all that was written about the Messiah that was to come. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. That makes sense. So there's a reason for these bulls and goats to be sacrificed that satisfied something in God, but it wasn't making him pleasure. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And that's where I showed last week that the first covenant was not adequate to do what God wanted. And he needed a second covenant. And Jesus came and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And they substitute here, I'm glad I'm reading it from the NIV, because the, the uh, King James says perfect. You have been made perfect, says. And by that will, by Jesus coming, we have been made perfect through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You have been made perfect once for all. Do you feel perfect? Let's go on and see what we're going to do with this. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duty. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Isn't that interesting? So Israel wasn't without sin. The, the sacrifices did not remove sin. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. When Jesus took his blood right up there on the, on the altar in heaven, we can't see it, but the only way we know about it is God told Moses to build this one just like that one. Here's the blueprint to build it. Use it, do it exactly like. So Jesus took his blood. And I, I've said this in the past that angels scoured the dirt to find and recover every drop of that precious blood. Because that precious blood 
that was offered was the blood of God to pay the price for your sin. Why must we believe in that? Because God said, I have given my blood. Jesus' blood was God's blood. When Jesus became a human, his blood was imprinted into Mary and the blood of God became alive in Christ without the sin of Adam to affect it. And since that time, since he sat down at the right hand of the God, since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. So Jesus is waiting for us under our feet. We are his feet. He's waiting for us to make his enemies. What's, what are his enemies? Sin, and which I have said sin is simply unbelief. I can do this because there's no judgment. That's unbelief. I can go do what I want to do because there's not going to be any retribution. That's called unbelief. Anything you do that is not of God is not of faith and is sin. <coughs> if you are doubting that God sent forth his son, then you do not have the benefits of it. That's what he's saying. You must believe that he is in order to receive the fullness of what God has for those who believe in him. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Did you catch that? You have been made perfect already. Your faith has made you perfect. You will never be more perfect than you are when you accept Christ and your sins are forgiven you. You are made perfect once and for all. That means that your sins cause your conscience to restore these sins and your conscience is made makes you aware that you need to confess your sins before God you have sin that is unconfessed confess your sins and he is faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness so you were you were made perfect and we maintain our perfection by confessing our sins before him. We are cleansed of all unrighteousness daily. Lord, forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me. Shut my mouth. That's, that becomes our biggest problem is our mouth is not connected with the Holy Spirit. Do all that you do as unto him. Let no word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is edifying for the moment. Uh-oh, I've let some words slip out that weren't edifying for the moment. That's sin. It's that simple. Okay, God, shut my mouth. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Done. All right, that's all. We're, done. We're even. Okay, let's get it on now. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their heart. You don't, okay, I'm reading the Ten Commandments. I'm trying to be good. No, you don't need that. God has put his spirit in you. He has hidden his law, his word in your heart. And I will write them on their minds. You know the Holy Spirit is in you. When you mess up, you know, you don't have to be reminded. And then he added, their sins and lawless deeds. 
I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Now, I told you that one of the things written, or one of the things that the book of Hebrews does is it gives seven warnings to believers. And I've been talking, I said in the, or the sixth chapter, it says, don't dance around with the fence. I've, I've stated that over and over. Listen again. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. And again, we've said that only the high priest could go into the holy of holies with the blood of the lamb. But he says, therefore, since you, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's the Holy of Holies back there, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body, that his flesh. Remember that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent in two and fell. That was a symbol of his body that separated us from the Holy of Holies. It was never needed again. They did not restore the, the veil once it was rent. I mean, we're talking thousands upon thousands of hours of sewing to put together a 14 foot by two foot by 20 foot curtain that separated and only the high priest could go behind there. And when, when the, Jesus died, the strangest thing happened. This veil that had been up here for 2,000 years, a thousand actually in, in this temple, a thousand years, it separated the priest from the Holy of Holies. And he said, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain. Through his flesh. His flesh is the curtain. That is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, baptism. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Do you re and, and this is the whole, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna close that right here. Can you imagine that you are the high priest of Israel? And, and you're getting ready to go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies with a cup of the blood of the Lamb to atone for the sins of the whole nation. And Jesus has said, you now are going to be able to do what the high priest did once a year. Anytime you want, you just go right, walk right in and say, hey, hello, Father. Here's Roy. How you doing? Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. Thanks for making access to you, Father. How often do you do that? How often do you walk into the Holy of Holies? Oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. Well, that's what Israel said. No, no, no. We'll talk to Roy. Roy, you talk to him for me. 
No, I don't do this. You do. You do. You go in and talk to dad yourself. I'm not going to be the Bible. That's what this is all about. Jesus said, nobody wants to go see dad. They won't do it. They won't go into the Holy of Holies. Not only that, he's waiting up there for us to put Satan under our feet. Well, you know, I don't want to make the devil mad at me. Go to hell, yeah. devil. Yeah. You have nothing to do with me and my family. Get your hands off me. Get your hands off my family. Get the hell out of here and my life and everything that I own and everything that I do. Lord, it's yours. And I come against Satan and his schemes and devices and strategies over my nation. Lord, tell him to get out of here. In the name of Jesus, Satan, get out of my country. This is my country. This is God's country. Do we act like that? No, no, we wouldn't want to get presumptuous and to think that we have authority. And Jesus rebuked the disciples and he said, Behold, I gave unto you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. But do not rejoice that demons are subject unto you. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is that how we act? No. How should we act? That way. Get after it, church. We, I, I don't want God to say, well, I was just waiting on Lake to get there. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. We're going to be there, folks. And I'm telling you, the church at large is not doing it. Because I know we're not doing it. We, we, we just don't think about it in those terms. But that's what the Scripture just got through saying. He's waiting for the enemy to be under our feet. What does that mean? It means we've got to take authority over our... Lord, I don't know about America, but I'm going to make sure that my house is in order. Lord, I don't see all things under your feet in my house. Get them there. That's the sermon. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your Word that shows us what Jesus has done, what You have done, Father. You've made us perfect. Oh, Lord, we keep stumbling around down here in our imperfection, thinking it's who we are, but it's not. All we have to do is rise up and say, I am perfect. I praise you, Lord, that you have cleansed me of all unrighteousness. I am your perfect vessel. Oh, Lord, everything that I say and do now is under your authority, under your control. Lord, make me what you want me to be. Speak the words through me you need me to speak. Regarding my family, regarding my nation, regarding the world. Give me the mind of Christ, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the first, second, and the last. Oh, sure.